Before I get going too much into the meat of things, you know, we got a, a diverse audience here. A lot of times I give talks like this to the hunting groups, um, but it's neat to give it to the community in general. Some of you are hunters out here, some of you are non-hunters, some just come to find out what's going on, and that's great. Um, we're all here, we're all conservationists one way or another, whether you hunt or not, so I appreciate everybody showing up here. Um, go ahead, that slide. One thing, this is a, a picture of Jackson County. I just want to give a little bit of background um, as to what's going on here a little bit. That'll lead into the migration component of this talk. Um, the black-tailed deer here in Jackson County are kind of unique. Some of you know this, but, but uh, let me just give you a little more history. The deer here migrate considerable distances, some of them do. Uh, unlike a lot of black-tailed deer up and down the Pacific, um, where they just move out of the snow zone, and some will move minor mileage, just a few. The black-tailed deer in Jackson County, from Douglas coming into Jackson County, they, some of those can migrate lots of miles, up to 60 airline miles, um, which is quite a distance. They sort of mimic what mule deer do on the eastern portion of the state and the country, where they'll make big migrations to designated winter ranges, for whatever reasons, to get out of the heavy snows, to get to a better uh, food source down lower, um, for breeding purposes, there's all kinds of different reasons. So our black tail seem to do that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this graph, it's kind of complicated. The main thing I want to show you is, <clears throat> the stuff here in the brown, this is considered winter range by us and Jackson County. This is the lower elevation stuff. In the 90s, our agency did some work with um, putting radio collars on black-tailed deer, primarily to figure out you know, what, what's causing their mortality. Other factors are you know, you know, where they're moving to and, and different things like that. So click the next one. With these blue dots that just showed up up here, all these blue dots, those are summertime locations from our black-tailed deer in the study in the 90s. Okay, some of these were trapped up there. Some of these were located up there. We flew with, uh, they, they all had radio collars on once we caught them. So we would find out where they're at, okay? Then in the winter, we would go find out where those deer moved to. Next slide. And that's the green dots, okay? So now some of these distances are short, 10, 15 miles. Some are like 60 miles. Some deer way up here near the park come, come all the way down into this area. You know, they come long distances. Okay, so we know these deer migrate, we've, we've known they've migrated. Now we got some documentation, some of the distances they're going. So, um, my colleague who's here today, Merv Wolfer, he was working with our agency, and he sort of pioneered the beginnings of this. We had trail cameras at the time, and uh, we wanted to get them set up on some of these trails to figure out what's going on. Now here's a trail. Some of you who've been out in the woods see lots of trails. Some are made by cattle, a lot are made by wildlife. Um, but if you zoom in on this, a lot of these tracks now, certain times of year, they're going all the same direction. Okay, they're, the deer are moving. They're going. Okay, so what, how, how, how do we figure out what's going on? Well, we started with these trail master camera systems. Okay, and this was good technology at the time. It was really good technology. Um, we had a whole bunch of these cameras on, on hand already. They're 35 millimeters cameras, little self winders, they got a little flash on them, and they had a remote port on them, okay? The remote port you can put to a sensor, and it was a beam type sensor, and it would break the beam and the camera would go off and you'd take a picture and then it would wind to the next film, okay? And it would work really good. We had some advantages and disadvantages of this system. I'm gonna show you some of that here in a second, but. You know, we already had them on inventory, so we didn't have to buy any. We had a lot of these on inventory already, so cost was nothing. And they had a really fast trip speed. I'll tell, talk to you a little bit more about that in a second. These new cameras that you can buy, the digital cameras, some of them got a, a fairly good trip speed. Quick, as soon as the beam's broken, it takes a picture. But a lot of them take a little bit to trigger it, okay? So the deer or wildlife can get way out of your field of view by the time it goes off. But these old systems really had an instantaneous trip speed. Uh, it went off, boom. And this is a picture of a deer taken by it. The disadvantage, it had a big flash that went off, poof, at night, 
okay? It's okay for a one-time shot. It's hard to get a second shot, <laughs> okay? Uh, and, you know, back in the day, uh, it's, it's not that long ago, but it seems like old technology now, you have to go buy a roll of film, right? <laughs> Put it in your camera. Well, you could run out of film. If the deer are moving, you could run out of film, and it, it happened a lot. Deer moving heavy, you run out, of, you go check your camera, and it ran out of film. Oh, no, how many deer did I miss? The other thing was really irritating was that noisy film advance I was telling you about. When that camera would go off, it's that little motor, you know, that whines. So there's some disadvantages and advantages, but <clears throat> go ahead, Tim. Here's what the system looked like. Here's the camera, the flash, a cable, a transmitter, and a receiver. Go ahead. And you would set it up on a tree by a trail. You used a couple of trees. And, you know, you'd set it up to where you would catch deer as they would come by but you would hopefully eliminate smaller animals, you know, a lot of smaller foxes and different critters, and you didn't want the camera going off for all that stuff. You, you, did, you caught some of it, but you didn't want it to go off all the time. So it took a little bit of time to set up, but it worked. It worked good. Um, here's the transmitter over there, of course, the camera and the receiver at this end, and the deer, as soon as it broke that beam, it took a picture, pretty instantaneous, works pretty slick. You actually get some really good photos when the flash goes off. It's some neat, neat photos. Go ahead. You know, here's some with some does coming by again at nighttime, and you catch the herd here. And go ahead. Daytime shots, no flashes involved, but you still got that motor that went off. Okay. Nice. There's the transmitter on the tree over there. Went through, tripped the camera, come through. So, but what we what we were seeing, and Merv was looking at this originally, is, you know, the camera, how many more deer were there that we missed? Okay, we didn't know. So we wanted to convert to a video system. Okay, go ahead. But in the meantime, we're trying to outsmart, we have this technology here a little bit, and we're coming through, go ahead, and then you see stuff like this. There's an eyeball. Dang it. There's a deer there, what is it? Is it a buck, is it a doe? What's going on? Okay, and Murph, we had a lot of this type of stuff going on. Next photo, or like this one. You know, here's some deer, pretty neat. And then, oh, you, know, you get your film back from the, and all of a sudden you notice, hey, there's a deer there. Well, and there's another one there. And they didn't jump out at you right away, but you know, their heads are hidden behind trees. What are they? Are they bucks or are they does? You can't quite take it. So what we did was get a splitter now, and we were gonna run two cameras. All right, we're going to get the, we're going to run another camera 25 feet over there. So when the beam was broken at a different angle, it'll take two pictures simultaneously at the same time with two different cameras. Really high tech stuff. And uh, we did that for this. We set this up like this. Um, and we have a cam, we have a cable running all the way back here to another tree way over there. And it's taking a picture. Get over here. It's taking a picture this direction from 25 feet away. Next slide. So that's those exact same two deer at the exact same moment that were behind the tree. So now we can figure out what they were. Pretty cool. All right, we thought we had this all figured out. But still, that noisy motor went off, the flash goes off at night. Still different issues. Next photo. This one was really culprit. Nice big buck comes through. There's an eyeball back there. Again, our, what is it? Our exact camera, our du duplicate camera set up. Next photo. It's a buck there. He would have never came through if we didn't set up two cameras. So we knew we were missing a lot of deer. And for what we wanted to do, we really wanted to capture, understand what was going on with all the deer coming through. That was our goal. Okay. So we switched over to a video system. Now, <clears throat> it's a more complex video system than you guys have seen some of you who have trail cameras right now that you can go buy at Sportsman's Warehouse. This one's a big system. It involves a housing, an actual video camera, a big 12-volt car battery, spotlights, uh, remote sensors. Um, it, the, it's just a lot more flexible. You can take full advantage of what's going on. For example, um, the length of video. We could have it set up, and we do, as long as there's deer there making a movement or just standing there, the video will run continuously. When there's no more movement detected, we just have it set up to run for another 17 seconds and then turn off, okay? 
we have it set up to where certain hours at night, I want you to turn the spotlight on. Big, light things up. Where that deer that just went by had a spotlight on. This is at night. Um, improve detail. As a deer come by, you can back it up, forward it up, get different views to find out. Is that, really a, is that really a fawn or is it a yearling? Is it just a big fawn or a small yearling? You know, is that a four point or was that just a three point? You can back it up and look at things. So you had a lot more uh, flexibility with this system. Again, the disadvantage, very expensive. At the time, you know, it was like a $3,500 setup. At the time, you know, that's a lot of money, considering the other system we had was free. We had it on hand already. It's heavy. Packing batteries in. Good thing Merv had some strapping young teenage boys when he got started to help him haul it in. Big 12-volt batteries, you're packing a mile into the woods. It's kind of tough. Bears. Why? I don't know. We still haven't figured it out to this day. But the bears eat, eat this camera. <laughs> OK? They, they, they seem to leave alone the smaller digital video cameras. They love these cords. And that's my big issue. Did a bear eat it today? And they've, they've eaten my cameras, mostly the cords. So go ahead, next slide. <clears throat> so here's the, here's the sensor. We screw this into a tree. And if the trail is coming this way down the path, we'll come back here and we'll point that sensor way up the path. So when it first detects the animals coming, it trips the, the sensor. The little computer says, OK, go to the camera, turn it on, um, leave it on for as long as you see movement, or 17 seconds if it disappeared. OK, here's the wires, two of them. One runs the light, one runs the battery. It goes up, goes over. Next slide. Goes over to a tree, up in the tree. I've got the battery mounted about 12 feet up in the tree. I've got the big housing inside here that holds the camera. I got a big spotlight up here. And up here, quite a ways, I got a big solar panel that's charging up this battery, because that spotlight draws a lot of juice out of that battery. So it's kind of complicated, cumbersome to set up. Once you get set up, it's some pretty good stuff. So next photo. Now I'm standing on the trail where the deer would be. <clears throat> we try to go on spots where you're off the road a little bit, and you could sort of get a straight-on view of the deer where they're walking or just slightly down. So the spotlight is shining right where I need to be. There's the housing of the camera right there. Inside it is the video camera. And uh, up here somewhere is the, the solar panel. I thought I had it. It must be maybe the next slide. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is a different camera on another trail. <clears throat> but there's the solar panel, spotlight. Housing video camera. OK? That's how it's set up. Go ahead. So you get some really neat stuff. Um, you get not only get to see pictures of, of nice big deer, small deer, different things, you get to see some behavior. You get to see the does sometimes weaning their fawns. Uh, when the fawns go to nurse, the does will turn around and just whack them hard in the face with their paw. Um, you, you, you know, you get to see some really neat behavioral stuff. You get to see some ugly stuff. Some nasty disease issues, big tumors hanging off a of deer, um, different things, wounded deer. Uh, they just come by slowly. You get to see this kind of stuff as they're walking, how they behave with that type of stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, daytime photo here. Get some neat stuff. And you know, a lot of people are taking. Uh, a lot of people are taking different trail cameras and pictures and different things like that. And it's neat. Everybody's, a lot of folks have these type of things. It's, a, it's become a really popular hobby. A lot of hunters go do some pre-scouting with these cameras. Not this type of camera, but other smaller digital cameras that will do video also as well as snapshots. Go ahead, Tim. And, uh, but what we've got going on here, and I'm almost to the meat of it, <clears throat> is we've been running this now for 18 years this setup. We've got a long database. And that's what we're going to show you here pretty quick. So what, what, what have we learned from this running this long-term database like this? We, we've got different things we want to look at. OK, neat to see the pictures, neat to see the bucks, the does, the fawns, other critters. But now, why? Why are they moving? OK, 
Do, is it the timing? When do they move? Uh, is it the timing of the calendar? They're just going to move? You know, or are there some environmental factors that are doing it? Is it rain, barometric pressure? Is it the combination of the two? Is it moon phase? What have you? We don't know. And then <clears throat> what we use for management purposes are the ratios of deer observed, you know, the buck to doe ratio and the fawn to doe ratio. We use that to determine if the herd is healthy and that kind of stuff. We'd like our buck ratio in the rogue unit to be over 15 bucks per 100 does. That's how we, we classify it. Um, some of our other units, we like it to be 20 bucks per 100 does or higher. Our fawn ratios, we like to see 30 or higher. Uh, shows good recruitment, nice young animals coming back into the population. So we can get that information from here, as well as our traditional methods, which is spotlighting and, and walking. Day versus night, when are they moving mostly? Daytime, nighttime, does it not matter? Who cares? Buck versus doe movement. Are the bucks coming out earlier? Are the bucks coming out later? Are they coming out at the same time? Um, these are things we wanted to look at. So we'll first focus on, go ahead, the timing of deer migration by the calendar. Okay, so <clears throat> what's going on? The timing of the year. Uh, you know, there's certain days have certain hours in them, hours have minutes, minutes have seconds. Go ahead. And how we looked at this, we converted the length of day to seconds. Um, and I just show you different shots here. Of sometimes we get them in the snow, what looks like summer, what looks like fall. Go ahead. But when the deer move, whether it's uh, early in the season, late in the season, I'm talking the fall here, um, why are they doing this for a certain year? Okay, go ahead. Next slide here. So this is from 1997 to 2012, all those years on the camera, a lot of data points. What we did was we, we took the data points of when the deer moved by date. Okay, like uh, whatever the day may be, September, or, uh, September 1st has so many seconds in that day. That's, we had to do that to graph it this way. Okay, so this dashed line represents 3,900 and some odd seconds per the day. That's October 13th. Okay, you follow that so far? I don't want to lose too many people. So if you look at all these years combined, October 13th, happens to be when the majority of deer always move, okay? That's where that bell-shaped curve comes together, October 13th. Okay, some years it's earlier than that, some years it's later, some years it's right on October 13th, but that's about when they move. So pay attention, I've got this line, this dashed red line, in a lot of graphs coming up, okay? Next slide. So in 1997, um, I got the dates down here. Here's again October 13th, roughly. You can see during October 13th, this is total deer that came through. The peak was roughly October 13th, October 12th, when the deer came through in heavy masses. Okay, go ahead. In 2007, 10 years later, you could see the majority of the does and bucks for the mass movement, the most that moved during the time, again, was a little earlier than that, a few days before October 13th. Okay. So again, October 13th seems to be the time. 2010, things were different that year. It was a, a very interesting year. Things moved really late, uh, you know, really late. This, the dates down here is roughly October 27th and 26th. We had some, a good charge here, it trickled off, but the big, huge movement came really late that year. You know, why? Why did that happen? Go ahead. 2011. You can see we had a nice big movement right around October 13th, but then a big charge of deer moved out here around the 1st of November also. Right? In 2012, similar sort of thing, but again, uh, the most amount of does and fawns moved just after that time frame. Again, a little bit later than normal, okay? October 13th seems to be about the, the time when you go over the 17 years when the average is movement. Go ahead. Okay, so, so they move. Well, why? Is this some environmental factors? What's causing them to make this movement? Some years they trickle out. Some years it's a mass exodus. They just blow out of the high country down to the low country. Let's go ahead. So first we looked at rainfall. Uh, you know, a lot of, some of you who are in here are hunters, love to go hunting during a, when it rains. 
uh, gets the deer out, gets them moving, or you're quieter when you walk through the woods, whatever the reasons are. So let's look at rainfall in 1997, precipitation. Inches of precipitation over here. Here's the date again. Number of deer that moved on the camera. The red, or whatever color this is, shows rainfall. So you see a burst of rain happened here, and there's some movement there. Um, again, a burst of rain happened here, a decent amount of rain, over an inch, inch and a half. And we got pretty good deer movement. That's kind of neat. Okay, then the deer sort of trickled and moved a little bit. Big blast of rain here, and not much deer movement here or here. Part of that is, part of that reason is, a lot of the deer have already moved, okay, during this time frame. But still, we, we didn't see much change over here. So keep that in mind when I show these things. The majority of deer on our cameras have moved the earlier section. When, so we're interested in the first part, what gets them to move, that kind of stuff, okay? So here's 2003. We basically get <laughs> no rain at all, a trace. I mean, this is less than a quarter of an inch, but it was something. And we had this huge movement of deer, little tiny bit of rain. Uh, again, a big chunk of movement here and some weather here. Was it the bar barometer, barometric pressure that did that? You know, different things to look at. Go ahead. Well, here's 04 now. Got a little tiny bit of rain here. A lot of deer came through. They trickled, a blast of rain, and then a blast of deer. Blast of rain, blast of deer, a blast of rain, and then nothing for a while. Again, most of the deer have moved, so rainfall during that year looks, hey, maybe it has something to do with it. Well, no, go ahead. Here's 06, little tiny bit of rain, here, here, not much movement, it tri triggered this, but then just this big dry spell, then all the deer moved. Rain didn't seem to have any effect that year. Okay, go ahead. Here's 07, it was like nothing, but this huge amount of deer moved anyways, regardless of rain or nothing. Okay, go ahead. So, I talked about barometric pressure. This one's kind of complicated to, to measure and to look at. Is it just the pressure change that's getting these deer to want to move? So, I did, a, I did a year here. Basically, this is the total change in daily air pressure. So, meaning whether it dropped or it went up. The pressure either dropped or it went up. The pressure changed, okay? Uh, we really couldn't find any correlation between pressure change and whether the deer decide to move or not. So the red bar is pressure change. It's changing, it's changing, it's changing. You know, but the deer moved here. Big, huge pressure change here. Didn't see any deer movement change. So, go ahead. We, you know, pressure, we looked at all the years. We couldn't find any correlation on pressure change with deer movement. Okay. Now, we get to the moon, the, the all-powerful moon. And uh, so here, 2008, let me explain the graph. Percent of moon is over here. So your full moon, your full, you know, the big bright moon, the big bright moon, the big bright moon, okay? The black, no, nothing, nothing. That's all this is as to where it fits on the calendar, okay? Here's that magical October 13th date again. So you look at this. You come here, huh, if it's big full moon, the deer moved. Hey, that works. Go to the next slide. 2009, the deer moved early that year. Hey, big full moon, awesome, the deer moved. Huh, go to 2010. By golly, there's a pattern here, right? A big full moon, the deer moved. That's looking pretty good. So if you were to just look at those two years, 08, 09, and 10, you'd say hey, it's the moon that causes these deer to move. By golly. Go ahead, next slide. Okay, here's 04. <laughs> okay, that's about as dark as you can get, and that's when all the deer moved is in this time frame. Go ahead, next slide. 05. 05 is over here. Uh, we missed the, yeah, go ahead, next slide. Here's 2001. Full moon here, full, oh, the deer moved in here after the full moon. So go ahead. And here's 2012, just a couple years ago. Full moon, here's all the deer that moved in, in this time frame. So if you, if you, if you look at 08, 09, and 10, you'd, you'd swear and it's a full moon. 
Don't ever go out to take pictures of deer or hunt for deer unless you're going out on a full moon because they're going to be moving. Okay, but then you look at all the years combined, there's really no correlation uh, that you can put any statistics on that's going to say the full moon makes the deer move. Go ahead. Okay, so like I said about ratios of observed deer, we use those for management purposes to figure out what's going on. Go ahead. <clears throat> so with the cameras going through, the video is on, you get to um, observe the critters as they come through. And you get to observe them in their natural type stuff. So here comes a herd of deer that's going to come through. This isn't edited. This is just the camera's just staying on, catching these deer as they're just slowly migrating down through. And you get a, um, I mean, some of these shots are, are pretty cool. You know, yeah. the daytime photos are always the best, lots of light. But just let this run. It takes about 40 seconds. Um, <laughs> to give you an idea of some of the things that we see. And they're coming, they're, you know, I think they can hear the camera running. The camera's got a little motor, like some of you have actually had the, the little digital eight tapes. They got that little motor, it's, it's a high pitch whine, even though it's quite a ways away from them. It's up in a tree, it's in a housing unit. Their ears are far better than ours, but they sometimes look up, you know, and they could hear it. But they're on a main trail some of you probably have noticed this rock. This rock is on one of our cameras, and it's a good reference point. Every year, I try to keep that rock in that exact same position when I hang the camera up every year, so you can see what's going on from year to year. But you know, as the deer come through, these are some good-looking deer. Uh, just coming through, it's got some does, fawns, and yearlings in here. And then you've got, uh, there's a little tiny buck that comes through. There. That's him. He had a little tiny antler over there. And they're coming through. And uh, you get to observe some behavior. And about 10 more seconds here. And there, this deer's looking back. There's something over here. And uh, here comes the big guy. Usually the big bucks like that don't usually run with the does this time of year, but sometimes they do. It's pretty neat to see. So we're interested in the buck-doe ratio. What's going on? Go ahead. So if you look from 1997 to 2012, what does this mean? So over here, this means that this 40, that means 40 bucks per 100 does. That's how our agency expresses things. Or if we're talking elk, we're talking 40 Bull, bulls per 100 cows, 40 cows per 100, 40 calves per 100. We express it in the ratio to, to does, to 100 does, okay? So here's the fawn ratio, going up and down, hovering between 40 and 60. Really good fawn ratios. That's plenty for recruitment. Uh, every year you can have lots of deer coming back into your population if all other factors are good, the habitat's good. Poaching's down, predation is down, all these things. So that's the fawn ratio. So we're happy with that. Buck ratios. Um, really, we manage for 15 bucks per 100 does right here in the rogue management unit and 20 bucks per 100 does in Evans Creek and, and some of the others. So we're well above what we need to do effective breeding with the population and provide escapement and for those that hunt to provide hunt surplus hunting animals. Okay? Okay, next slide. So, this is a little busy, this graph, but let me explain it to you. Again, over here, fawns per 100 does. The red line was the one I just showed you, fawns per 100 does. That's the ones taken from our video camera, okay? We also do historic routes we've been doing for 60, 70 years with spotlighting, 50, 60 years, and walking routes in certain zones where we get the herd composition. How many does per, fawns per 100 does are out there, how many bucks per. Our video camera work kind of matches what we find in the Rogue unit and the Evans Creek unit from our other methods. Okay? It's, it's following that. It looks about the same. Now, let's go to the bucks and see what the bucks looks like. So here are the bucks. Our video camera work is way up here. And here's our buck work with the other traditional spotlight routes and our walking routes. 
for many years, these two years were about the same, but it's still above here, our video cameras found a lot more bucks than our spotlighting routes did and our walking routes. And, you know, that's sort of to be expected. We didn't think it would be that big of a difference that we'd find a lot more bucks on our video cameras than our spotlight routes and our walking route. Um, but other people spotlight, not just ODFW. Uh, some bucks get smart and they stay out of range. Um, other people hike, other people walk during the daytime. You know, bucks don't want to be seen. They'll stay out of vision, out of way, so it's harder to find. But during this video system, for this many years, it's in, no people are there. Uh, you get a better representation of what's out there. So the, the buck ratios on our video cameras are, are higher. And that was interesting to see. Go ahead. Okay, day versus night movement. We're, we're finishing up here with a couple more, so go ahead. What's going on with these deer? Do they move during the day? Do they move during the night? Does it split? Doesn't matter. Uh, go ahead. You got a couple shots. This is a nighttime shot, actually, with a flash. There's another big buck right way back there. You can't really see it very good, but with a Merv would get his magnifying glass out when he was working with our agency to see what he could find in there. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, but you get some nice big big bucks coming out in the daytime also. Go ahead. And. This buck, I just, I threw it in for it. See his tail, how bent it, it's crooked. It flop, it's broken right here. Uh, three years on the video system, I got to watch this buck come through. This is the first year. And the next year he came through, uh, his antlers were pretty massive. And then the third year he came through, his antlers were just really huge. And uh, he's got this unique double throat patch here and here, which a lot of deer have, but, and that busted up tail. <coughs> And he's got these uh, extra points on this back tine. So I got, and he kept those extra points on the back tine the next year and then the next year. Go ahead. Okay, I apologize for this type of a graph. Some people hate these things, it makes them seasick. But it was the best way for me to explain sort of what's going on here. So bear with me. The bottom is the clock, seven o'clock in the morning, 2400 hours, there's midnight all the way down to six in the morning, okay? Over here is number of deer that come through the cameras. 2006, okay? The, the bucks are in the blue, and the does and fawns are in this reddish color. So first thing in the morning, a lot of activity, it drops off. This period right in here, a lot of deer aren't moving, okay? For those of you that are hunters, that's the time you go back and get lunch. Okay, but then when the evening comes around, the deer come out again, and they move again. Next slide. 2006, it's the same exact thing. I put it in a pie chart. So, nighttime movement of the does and fawns, does and fawns, 68% of them moved at night, 32% of them moved during the day. Next shot. The bucks, 82% of them moved at night. Only 18% moved at night, day and night. Okay, day and night, I can get it straight. Okay, 2009, the exact same thing. First thing in the morning, the deer move pretty good. It drops off this period down in here. Again, lower movement, daytime hours. As the evening comes, the surge of deer comes, more deer move. Next slide. Again, 60% of the does and fawns moved at night, 41% at daytime. Next one. Bucks that year was almost similar. 60% at night, 40% during the daytime. There was uh, one year, I think it was, uh, I didn't want to show it because I didn't have a, a lot of data points, but there was 90% uh, of the deer of the bucks moved at night one year. So <laughs> it was pretty skewed. Go ahead, the next slide's kind of interesting. We put the camera up in 2004 in the springtime, okay, to catch the deer going back up to the high country. What's going on then? Well, it was just the opposite. This is all deer now. Only 18% of them moved at night, and 82% of them moved during the daytime. You know, are they avoiding the hunter predator during the fall season? Who knows? But deer are pretty smart. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, buck versus doe movement. This is the last series of information here. What are the bucks? They come out a lot. We classified a buck as even this little guy, as long as he had a hardened antler, okay? There's a little tiny hardened antler. Go ahead. 
up to the big guys. Okay, those were our bucks. All right, go ahead. And some of them moved during the day, some moved during the night. Bear with me on these graphs. I'll talk to you through them. <clears throat> You'll begin to understand them after the second or third one for sure. Okay, this is 2006. Cumulative blacktail deer movement. So let me explain this to you. Percent of deer over here, 0%, 100% of the deer that moved on the camera. The timing of the date, here's the magical October 13th time frame, okay? So as the deer start moving, let's pick uh, the does and fawns in the blue. As they start moving, okay, you get to this date here, and roughly 20% of the deer move that were on the camera. Okay, as you go these steeper lines like this, that means deer are really moving, right? A lot of percent of the deer come through. Okay, when you get to over here, they're barely trickling through. The percentage hardly changes. Okay, a lot of deer moved in this time frame. Then they slow down on their movement, okay, until all of them have moved. So if you look at this graph in 06, here's the does. Does come out maybe a little earlier. They come out, but they kept moving, okay? And almost 100% of the does have moved roughly by November 10th, where only you know, 85, 88% of the, of the bucks have moved, okay? And as the season goes on, the bucks, 100% of the bucks have moved. Okay, we'll show the next slide. 2007, okay, this is the year that they all moved right at once, a lot of them, boom. All these deer move at once, okay? They just really moved. The bucks sort of taper off, the does move up a little bit more, you know, almost all the does have moved right here, and less than 80% of the bucks have moved. And the bucks just slowly trickle in as the season goes on until they all move. Next slide. Okay, and this year, especially 2008, look at that. Huge amount of movement in this time frame. A lot of the animals moved. Again, the does seem to come out all the way first, and the bucks just trickle in until late November. Okay. You get in the field, see what's going on here now. So next slide, this is 2009. Again, big movement. <clears throat> Almost identical for bucks and does. More of the does come a little bit. The bucks sort of lag behind a little bit. They're all moved. Next one. Okay, and then 2010, that was a really strange year for a lot of movement. Um, they moved a little bit later. The does kind of trickled up, moved a lot more doe movement. Bucks and does moving here pretty good. Does kept going, the bucks. Sort of just a few here, a few there until they met. And then, go ahead, 2011, kind of interesting. The does come up almost moving the same rate until right about here. So bucks came through. Again, the does finished up first. The bucks come in later. Go ahead. And then 2012 was an interesting year. A lot of the does come through. They trickled in. Bucks moved, and then they stopped. The bucks just stopped moving. And like one or two would come, and another would come, another would come. And then towards the end of November, just a bunch of bucks moved all at once. So on average, if you compare all the years, yes, the bucks seem to move a little bit later than the does. They come out a little bit later. Who knows what reason? Let the does go through first, uh, establish their territories, get into the winter range. Um, the bucks maybe are staying up high. There's no need for them to move yet. Maybe they're a little tougher. Who knows, but uh, we do see a difference with the buck and doe movement when it comes to the bucks coming out a little bit later. Go ahead. So we got just a series more of slides here um, of different animals and different, go ahead. And you could spend just like five seconds on each slide, Tim, and, and go through here. This one, pause right here for a second. Some of those deer that we had collared in the 1990s and uh, the early 2000s, we, and late 1990s, we, we actually picked up a couple of them. Um, that's one of them that was collared with a radio transmitter on. Go ahead. There's some nice critters. You can keep going, Tim. And of course, all the other stuff. <laughs> I've been showing you just deer, but you'll see, as with anything, these things pick up everything. This is a big old bear. I'm sure he ate my camera that day. <laughs> Go ahead. And we get. One or two cougars a year on our cameras coming through. Go ahead. This elk was on opening day of Cascade elk season, I think. He was a little nervous. He'd come flying by. And even we get some bovines coming through. 
So this is an elk. I threw this one in because just interesting behavior. You get to watch them up close. Uh, she's just scratching her ear. Go ahead. And during the snow, it's kind of neat to see, especially the fawn that follows this one. Ears pinned down, looking up at the snowflakes, like, what is this stuff, you know? So. <laughs> it's kind of neat to see some of this different behavior. Some of the bucks come through a little weary. They're, especially the bigger bucks, some of them, if they're not rutting yet in that behavior of wanting to find a doe, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty, that's why they, they live older, because they're, they're, they're cagey. They, they're, there's a cougar, a smaller one, come through. And we get the turkeys. There you go. What is this one? There's another big buck here. Now, I've got other videos of some, <clears throat> some really monster bucks, but I didn't want to get accused of just showing off the incredibly big ones. We do have an array of sizes of bucks, but there's some really big bucks that have come through on these cameras. It's neat to see. Let's see. Okay, go ahead. Well, ah, yeah. Now this is in, when I got this one camera positioned. It's in a neat spot because you can get the deer coming up from this trail. You get the deer walking along this trail, and sometimes they'll go up here where it's out of the camera. A lot of times they'll go up here, and sometimes they'll continue along the trail here. So it's a junction. I can't get them all. I'm trying to figure out a way to catch them all in there, but it's, I just can't do it. So I miss deer all the time right there. That's, I know he ate my cameras. <laughs> and that's it. So, um, you know, we've been doing this for a lot of years. Uh, and we got two video cameras now. That's all that we have out there, pretty much. It's just the two video cameras. No more of the trail cameras, the little tiny guys. I put them out for fun, just for different spots. But for a long-term database, we're using just the video analysis now. It gives you a lot better perspective of what's going on out there. So um, that's all I had. I mean, if you guys got some questions, I'll be glad to add. Yeah? When you talk about the winter range, what elevation are you talking about? Does it come down to? Well, pretty much below 3,500 feet is really what, what we talk about. Now, all the stuff around Cascade Ranch, Lake Creek, C2, you know, where you get that big white oak, manzanita, uh, buckbrush mixture, that's like the primo stuff. But you can even, the so winter range still goes a little higher than that. It'll get up into a mixed conifer forest. Um, but it's pretty much that stuff below 3,500 feet in, in Jackson County. Now in Josephine County, it's a little different criteria. They don't move like the deer do over here. Some, some areas do, but there's a 2,500 foot level that we say is pretty much it. They're more of a move with the snow type thing in Josephine County. There is some migratory movement where there's snow or not, but Jackson County is really, it doesn't matter if there's snow, no snow, drier than a bone, as you saw, they're going to move. They're just going to move on certain times. Anything else? Hmm. I'll wait my turn. Else no, no, nobody raised their hand. Go ahead. Well, up where I've hunted, I've noticed two different sizes of some are huge, even the does are huge. And, you know, then you go down into a lower area and they're not near as big. Well, <clears throat> I don't know where you're at exactly, but if you compare some 5, of the town 5, deer. 5,000 foot elevator. Yeah. If you compare some of the town deer, <laughs> the Jacksonville deer, the Ashland deer, uh, the Roxy Ann deer, some of those are residents, they don't move. Some of those shady cove deer, some of those are pretty tiny, scraggly looking things. Um, without a doubt, the migratory component seems to be more robust. Uh, so, but, you know, I don't have any science to base that on. I just know that some of those local deer are pretty pathetic looking. Well, some of my 
you know, hunter friends say, oh yeah, they mixed with some of the mule deer and bred with the mule deer. That's why the black tails are bigger. Well, keep in mind where we're at down here in southern Oregon, um, our habitat, um, and the mule deer are just over the hill, okay? And for some of you who don't know, blacktail and mule deer are the same species. They're just different subspecies. They can interbreed. There's no problem with that. The whitetail and mule deer are two different species, okay? They're different. But the blacktail and mule deer are the same exact species. They're just different subspecies. And sometimes they do interbreed. <clears throat> but down here in the southern portion of the Cascades, our habitat changes. It's different than the central and northern Cascades. We've got, especially down here in the winter range, more open area. Uh, it's more Eastern Oregon-ish, if you can say such a crazy word. But, and, and, and it's true. Some of our blacktail deer down here in Southern Oregon are bigger than any blacktails you're gonna find anywhere in Oregon. Uh, especially yeah. when you guys have in your conference room. In the yeah, those are monsters there, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Anything else? Yes. What do you see in population changes with uh, like uh, mortality caused by crowd? Too many deer. Too many deer? Well, where we see too many deer, those areas I'm telling you about, those local, yes. those local areas, people feed them. Uh, they're a wreck, to be honest with you. They're disease-infested, crazy deer. Uh, they, 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 they. Deer hair loss syndrome spreads more rampant in, in, when all those deer are together. The lice, louse can go from deer to deer. Uh, they feed out of the same feed source. When adenovirus comes through, it'll hit them harder. Um, it, it, it makes a big difference when there's too many deer. Yeah. But not a problem up at that 3,500 foot elevation? Well, you know, up above there, the deer are scattered. Um, the adenovirus can go up there. Um, we do see some deer hair loss syndrome when we do our routes, but when you get those lower animals like that that people are feeding, it's, it's, it's not a good food source. Um, they're, they're packed into a certain area. Um, it's just never good to feed wildlife, and you see it by the way that those deer look. And it could be there's too many deer in the area. It could be that it's just there's a parasite we don't know about. Um, who knows? But it, it's just, they're not healthy, those it's lower deer. Well, I, I, I blame you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there a, uh, can you tell if there's a, a real difference in migration rates and things like that about concerning where poachers hang out and, and that kind of stuff? Does that interrupt the, the uh, routes at all? Um, I want to show you something here. Let me go a little faster here, Tim. Let me pull up this graph if you don't mind. Just take me a, just take me a second. Answer, sort of answer. Part of your question. If I get out of this video. Okay, this graph here. Let me just show. I showed this to you earlier. Um, yes and no. Okay, this. If you look in 2005, right here in the rogue unit, this data was collected by our traditional methods, which is our spotlighting routes. We had a lot of competition that year with a bunch of kids from Eagle Point High School that uh, shot multiple dozens of deer, bucks, big ones, and there were some convictions and everything. They were in one of our areas that we typically use. This right here was directly a result of them shooting all the deer poaching the deer, spotlighting them, harassing them. The deer just got hammered, and we hardly saw any when we did our traditional route. So you, our routes can take effect. Yes, that kind of stuff can play a role in whether the deer hang in there or not, or whether you see them. Yeah. yeah. Have you noticed any correlation with the temperatures? Uh, we, <laughs> we, I've always heard that the elk will stay until the uh, cold pushes them out more than the snow. Does. Well. Mark, could you that he, he asked if we noticed any difference in temperature, whether temperature has a factor in moving deer or elk. Cold, snap. and cold snaps. And, and the elk, he says, may, he's heard, may come out until it's colder. 
We looked at temperature for this a little bit. We, sh we saw nothing. But, you know, temperature for elk, uh, you know, they're just a huge bodied animal. Um, it's going to have to get really, really cold for them to do something. They're going to find it probably better to stay up higher where there's deeper snow and, and stay in the insulated snow. Sit down in that and, and find protected areas. Um, but we didn't find anything for deer on temperature that moved it. And, you know, we've had years where it's, it's cold, it's frozen, and the deer move, their mass exodus comes through. And we've had years where you can't have fires up there. Fire, it's 90 degrees, and the deer still blow out. So there was, we couldn't find any relation with deer on that, yeah. Now, they don't ruminate, right? They're not ruminators? They are. They yep, are? they all have rumens. They yep. Chew? They do. Yeah, they, they'll, they got rumens, and, and they, it generates a lot of heat, their, their rumen does. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, Mark, what's the next step in technology? I mean, it seems like microchipping or GPS uh -huh. or what? what well, is you know, if it wasn't so expensive, uh, Bill, I would love to put a bunch of GPS collars on these deer. When, when Merv was doing the work back in the day, <laughs> I could say, we used the VHF colors, and you, they, you had to track them with a, an airplane to figure out roughly where they're at, you know, the signal. Then you got to go in on hand and try to figure out roughly where they're at. I would love to get a bunch of GPS collars on some of these deer, and that information is just transmitted up to a satellite one, two, five times a day. You sit at your computer, and you can see, you get really detailed how long is the deer staying in this dense cover. You know, how long is he staying in the open at night? There's so much you could do with it. But they're three to 4000 a collar for that kind of stuff. They're expensive. Then you got to rent the computer. The company who does that is called Vectronics. They charge you a huge monthly fee to use their website because they own the satellite. <laughs> so that's, that's some neat technology. That's what I would like to see coming up. Now, you hear of pit tagging deer and, and putting a pit tagging station. It's a little tag like... Some of you may have had your pets done with a tag, but it's a little different technology where when they run through uh, something, it'll trigger, tell you what deer it was. Again, that technology is not quite there yet for deer, but it's been talked about. If you can tag a bunch of these deer like that, the problem is, is getting it sensitive enough to detect them because their hides are thick and you, you may not be able to detect them when they come through the sensor. There's different things like that out there people are experimenting with, but I would love to get two dozen GPS collars. You're looking at time you do all that. That's a hundred thousand dollar project by the time. You... And that's what's on the wolf. The... Yes, the wolf that's running around here. He's got one of those on him. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I appreciate the turnout tonight. Um, Thank you. Yeah.